find out if you're ready for love. Here's your marvelous host, Nikki Lee. Hello, and welcome to Ready for Love Radio. This is your host and love coach, Nikki Lee. Now, I'm looking at a book, and it says The Status Game. The Status Game and Discover Your Gauges Workbook. What in the world could that be? I'm looking at that, and I'm like, hmm. Now, I like gauges. I'm very into cars, all muscle cars, but that's a whole other show. Now, this is, includes everything you need to understand yourself, who you're attracted to, and why you choose the friends you have. You know, I've kind of wondered why I like the kind of people that I like. Because, you know, some of them are like me, some of them aren't. They're all a little unique, so that, you know, that, that explains, you know. Um, but I've, I've always kind of wondered about that. So it, 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 that kind of got my interest. It kind of did. So I'm like, that would, it would be interesting to know that. But gauges, dashboards, huh. And like I said, I'm into cars. I'm into cars, so I like the idea of all that. So how I, I, I want, but status, how does status work into that? Okay, all right, I'm, I'm curious. My interest has peaked. So my guest tells me he can explain all this to me. So I figure I have him on the show. He can explain it to me and to you all, or to y'all, as we say down here in the South. So, so Mark Bradford is my guest today. So, Mark, welcome to Ready for Love Radio. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me. And and you can explain all that to us, right? I would like to think so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not not cocky, overconfident. I like that. I like that. Okay, but we're gonna we're gonna give it a shot. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so Mark is obviously an author. He's a speaker. He's a podcast guest today, but a host usually. He's a coach and builder. He invests a great deal of time and effort into researching a subject to come up with an explanation for it that everybody can understand. Okay, we may challenge that today. <laughs> His Podcast interviews and experiences have taught him what life's made of and what all relationships are based on. You know, let me finish this and then I'll ask you. It's in his nature to build things that fix, augment, or create a solution. And the fruits of his labors have been a dating site, eight books, a pilot's license for aerial photography, a coaching system, and a card game. Now, you know, do you, have you found that through having a podcast, you have learned a lot of interesting things. Uh, I, I've learned some things, yes. I've learned some things. With my podcast, if, you, if you're saying specifically learned from guests, I have learned some things, yes. I've had some, some things validated, but I've learned a lot producing and creating these one-off 10-minute episodes as well. So... Uh, that I think is when, believe it or not, I've I've learned even more. You know, I I find that that the show having the show gets me inspired to dig into things deeper, and I I love that you know I'll I'll see something and it gets me curious, and then I'll bring the person on, and it gives me the opportunity to dig into things and that I, I probably wouldn't take the time to do otherwise just because things are so busy normally. Gotcha. You know? so, so for me, that equation is that I would, uh, you could call it waste or expend the amount of time and effort required to learn something anyway because I can't seem to help myself. But right. um, when it comes to people, it's a wonderfully selfish thing to have a podcast <laughs> because you can have these, I mean, everyone benefits and you put all this effort into producing, you know, in high quality and writing mm-hmm. articles and all that wonderful stuff. However, 
it's right. so it feels so wonderfully selfish because I get to talk to people and ask these direct questions and say, well, wait, I don't understand this. How does this work? And can we delve deeper into that? Which is something you can't do when you have the book in front of you or you see them on an appearance somewhere. And, you know, people like, exactly. and, I, and I mention this often, I was one of the last people to talk to John McAfee, the person who literally invented antivirus he worked for. NASA, you know, a UNIVAC, he invented a ton of things. He's a millionaire who ran for office twice. He, you know, he was wanted for murder, allegedly, and all that stuff. And I got to ask him direct questions and have him clarify things. And it was the most wonderful and frightening thing imaginable. So, yes, in, in that case, it's, it's very, very interesting and very uh, enlightening. Isn't it, isn't it awesome? I, you know, well, and I, I got to, like, sit down and interview and i'm i'm fascinated with like forensic stuff right mm-hmm. absolutely fascinated and have you ever heard of dr bass from like the body farm at the university of tennessee the the fishing guy no i was kidding no i i've never heard of him i'm sorry <laughs> okay well he's he invented this place called the body farm okay and he does forensic research mm-hmm. to help figure out how you analyze a dead body to figure out how long somebody's been dead based on okay. like the bugs and all this kind of stuff. Okay. I got to interview him in person. <laughs> it was fascinating. Okay. And he jokes that he's been in more graves than like dead bodies have because of all the research he's done. But I got to like sit down and pick his brain. Very and it cool. was incredible. You know, and I got to do this on like book TV. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just it's fascinating mm-hmm, very. i got to sit down with my, my favorite author and like pick his brain about something and like like figure oh, well, thank out you. a plot issue in my book <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny okay okay well you're not yet but okay this was jeffrey deaver <laughs> who is my favorite th- thriller author you know? gotcha but you know, it's just, it's so amazing the things you get to do, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I've, there's, there's people that I've had on the show that are now great friends. And it's just, it's amazing. And then you get to share this awesome stuff that you learn with right. the audience. Right. Oh, my gracious. I just, I love it. And I'm coming up on, like, September 1st will be 10 years. Oh, congratulations. I, wow. Just wow, but it, uh, wow, I love it, absolutely love it. But and and you do fiction and nonfiction yes, as far as being a both. writer. You, got, you just you got to do both. It just, it just I don't know if you, fun. I don't know if you have to do both, but I for some reason do both. So it's it's a it's a very different experience and journey to do fiction versus yes. nonfiction. In fact, I even have. Um, some seminars and classes for people who are writers and aspiring writers in which I, I talk about the difference between fiction and nonfiction, about how nonfiction is a hierarchical arrangement of thoughts, how fiction has actually got three elements, and as long as you focus on the correct element, you don't ever have writer's block and all that good stuff. So, yeah, it's very, very different animals. I actually developed a series of classes on character development. And, you know, how I develop my characters and, and, like, creating the world for them to live in and all this. And, oh, I just love it. I love it. I don't get the time to do it because I'm doing so much nonfiction kind of stuff and the show gotcha. and all that. But I just, it, yeah, I love it. It's so much fun. But I've, I've created two and have, like, uh, six or seven, will have six or seven total books when I'm done. But, yeah, I just, ah. I, I love it. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> wow. So much fun. So much fun. Okay. But that that's what my old radio show used to be about, was about writing. Okay. <clears throat> then I got so busy writing, I didn't have time for that show anymore. Okay. So now that we've gotten way, 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 way off track. Now, status. One of two, well, three of your books are about the status game. So explain to me the title of the status game. And and you have this idea about status that is very different. Tell us about that. Let's start there. So the premise of the status game is something that I discovered when I got divorced and was 
in the dating pool and just immersed myself mercilessly into going on dates and things. And I started to notice a pattern. And that noticing of a pattern is basically what one of my core skills is, is in which I see systems and everything. And then I say, oh, I need to figure out the system. I need to explain it and distill it so that everyone else understands it. And thus, the status game, the original book, was born. And that one was mostly about um, dating and online dating and all the foibles there. But the, the status is not just what we all consider let me let me phrase this properly we all consider to be you know if somebody says hey i'm the emperor of the known universe oh i'm so impressed and i like you you know that that sort of thing obviously <laughs> social status and, and and things like that are very important just like the things that people think about money and fame and fortune and all that stuff is a status thing but there's more to it than right. that because the usage of the word status is also basically saying, what's your current situation? So it's like situation versus status. So, so, and that's where the gauges came in. On your car, you have a dashboard, and the dashboard has gauges. And the larger the gauge, the more important the thing is it's trying to tell you the status of. And typically on cars, it's the speed because that's what's going to kill you first, not how much oil you have. <laughs> so, and then the, the dials get small, smaller and smaller and smaller and so forth as their importance wanes. So I picture that we all have a dashboard of these gauges as well. And these gauges indicate to us the things that we're attracted to other people for. So, you know, typically, let me give you a couple examples. Typically, like um, men will be attracted to youth and exuberance and energy. So they may have a gauge for that. You know, women typically would be attracted to something as, as simple and silly as height, because it, it, it may not be the height, it may be the security that height provides for them. It reminds, you of the, reminds them of their dad when they used to dance with them when they were 11 years old. You know, something like that is very important to them, and they would have a gauge for that as well. So just like your car, you have all these gauges, and you look at the needles when you connect to someone, and you go, oh, hello, what's all this then? And then you say, okay, I'm where I want to be. I'm attracted to them. And this is an automatic thing. This is not something that you typically go, hmm, I wonder if I'm attracted to this person. So that's what I mean by status and status. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay. All right. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. It's funny that the gas gauge is so small then. Okay. Um, okay. I got, I understand that. Um, so status isn't necessarily a positive or high status. It's just a, like a characteristic kind of thing. Yeah, it's it's sort of like a list of characteristics that turn you on, things that attract you, and you know, and and they they could literally turn you on, or they could just turn you on physically or emotionally or intellectually or or psychologically in some way. And you say, yeah, that's what I kind of like in people. I like a person who's flexible. I had a horrible experience with my ex-husband, so I like people who are loyal. I like people I can depend on. I like people who are a good dad, and all those things uh, show up on your dashboard, and then you have a certain minimum in which it sort of kicks in and says, oh, this person registers now on my good dad dashboard or something like that. And by the same token, this can also keep pulling you in a bad direction because if you have a gauge, again, I'll just pick on tall. If you have a gauge for really tall <laughs> and you have a friend, Marcy, who always dates guys who are six, five and, and taller. And she says, why do I keep, why do I keep ending up with all these a-holes? Well, because you don't care about the personality. You just care about their height. You're not focusing on right. that at all. You're completely ignoring that. And people do that all the time. I mean, people do that all the time with not only elements that are physical and obvious, but they do that with things that are not so physical and obvious, like like wealth or or you know status in the community or something like that. You know, so that all plays yeah. a part in that. And if you were to map that out, I'm sure that you could basically look and see this invisible dashboard and go, oh, that's my thing. That's my type. And that's what I tried to do in the book is have the workbook give you what your thing and your type is for not only the people that you're attracted to, but also your friends. And also when you look in the mirror and go, yeah, that's what makes me me. Yay. I'm going to go have a cup of coffee. I deserve it. Yay. You know, so, so that's, that's where that all comes from. Well, it's their patterns. Yeah. I talk about that in here a lot. Okay. Um, so, and, and you say that, that the status, there's three forms of the status. Is that right? 
Or did I read that wrong? Well, it's yeah, yeah, it's three forms of attraction. So when you're attracted to someone, it typically takes one of three forms. And and the form you either make a you make a, a physical connection, an intellectual connection, or a spiritual slash emotional connection to someone. Basically, if if you if you chop it into three pieces. Now, just to make it more confusing, we all basically make a physical connection to people. You know, we all we all kind of look and say, "Oh, hello," you know, because we have this ability through evolution and and whatnot that we can literally sweep a room of forty people and go, "I'm attracted to that." person i'm attracted to that person and your brain just went through all these algorithms and said it's because the way they're dressed the way they carry themselves this part eyes are are closer together and i like that uh this sort of thing the way you know all that stuff plays a part in mere seconds of you saying i i have sort of a spark at a distance with this person and i'd kind of like to get a closer look on them and then you make this you know spiritual connection with someone because man their heart's in the right place and man they just they're just such a good person you know they're kind of not really attractive but they're really a good person you know and then you can have people who make an intellectual connection in which you have these just crazy talks about science and and the universe and you can also have the emotional connection with someone where where you just feel that they just they're just the right person who does the right thing or they went through something tough in their marriage or whatever. And you go, wow, that's someone who really has, has a heart that I really appreciate. Interesting. Okay. And emotional and spiritual, you've got lumped together. I do because they're, they kind of can, can become the same thing. I could have done four, but yeah. So, so because for some people, Spiritual may literally mean spiritual. There are people who literally are out there where you have to check the box of, I am this religion. I have this belief system. I run into that all the time. Um, and then there are people who, who are also just um, emotionally want to make a connection with someone, which, you know, I would say you could lump those things in together because people who have similar spiritualities are going to have kind of an emotional connection in that anyway. You're not going to have a really strong spiritual connection with someone and not have any emotions involved. Right. Okay. I just cool. just noticed that and wanted to dig a little deeper. Oh, by all means. Okay. Please. So so how all of all of this that you just told us, how does that impact our lives? Um, it impacts our lives all day, every day with everyone that we ever connect with. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's ever an omnipresent. It's the kind of thing that makes you shop different. It's the kind of thing that makes you stay at a job that you hate. It's the kind of thing that makes people cheat on their wives. It's the kind of thing that makes people depressed and makes people happy, makes people pursue a certain hobby. It's with us at all times because these are the things that we make connections on. These are the things that are important to us. And uh, for example, you may keep pursuing a job in finance, even though you don't like finance, but you like order. <laughs> order, is really, order and predictability is really important to you, maybe because of the way you grew up, or maybe it just makes you feel good that nothing's going to come out of nowhere. And numbers don't do that. You know, if you're a theoretical physicist, sure. But if you're somebody who's doing the accounting for a small company, no. So that can literally dictate the kind of job that you want to have. It can literally dictate where you move because of the kind of people that you're attracted to, whether it's friends or otherwise. You're attracted to people who have lots of energy, who have interesting thoughts and hopes and dreams and aspirations. So you move here where all those people are kind of crazy and nutty and hip and trendy and they do all that stuff. Or maybe you want comfort and you want loyalty and you want calm. So then you move somewhere else where you get a lot more of that. So it can dictate so much in your life. Interesting. Huh. 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 Well, I mean, I, I hadn't moved very far in my life, but the type of people around has not been a deciding factor. Hmm. That's interesting. Huh. Hmm. I got to think about that one. Okay, let's let's lighten things up for a couple minutes here. A little bit, a little bit. Um tell me tell me what it's like being a single dad. 
I thought you wanted to lighten things up. <laughs> um, well, it was rather difficult. Um, now um, I've launched my kids and I'm an empty nester. So that's, that's, that's a little bit easier. But being a single full-time dad was actually rather difficult because people assumed as a male that I knew less, nurtured less, and was fumbling through life. So um, I remember people would see me and my daughter out. I have two kids. And, they, and the, the waitress would be like, oh, is today daddy-daughter day? Thinking it would have oh. to be some sort of exception for a, for a man to actually go to dinner with his little 10-year-old daughter. And I would look at her and say, no, it's Tuesday. <laughs> so <laughs> um, the same thing happened with like dressing rooms with my daughter, in which I was literally chased out of a couple of them. Because uh, and one of them, I remember it was a, a store... A uh, woman pushed me out and I wasn't, I mean, I was back where the stall areas are. And my daughter said, I'm not going out there and parading dresses around by people. You know, kids have body image and all that stuff. She said, just come over here. So I right. came over there and waited. And so the lady conducting or, or managing it pulled me aside and said, you're going to have to sit out here because you're making the other women nervous. And I thought, there aren't any other women here. Wait, <laughs> what are you talking about? And so finally... <laughs> There was one woman in one of the dressing rooms, and I thought, okay, this is the person who complained. She comes by me, and she literally put her hand on my, on my leg, like really hard, and then she tapped me, and she said, my boyfriend raised his daughter from three years old by himself. You did not make me feel uncomfortable. And I was like, oh, oh. okay then. So that meant, that meant a lot to me. But it really was a weird waters to sort of you know, navigate, and, and, and being a single dad was very interesting. Um, I would do it all again in a heartbeat. All the complaints that I have, I would happily, happily live through all those years again and again and again. I just, I, it was just absolutely amazing. So, um, so yeah, so what I did was I had my kids full time and I also was juggling my entrepreneurship and my, you know, being, being a solopreneur and all that stuff. So that was a little difficult trying to be in two places at once and, you know, and just trying to balance all the work life and all that stuff. And that's what led me to do the coaching thing because I kind of figured out what life was made of thanks to a psychologist that I took my kids to. <laughs> Mm. Definitely an interesting perspective. So, so obviously you made the employee nervous as what was going on. She yes. couldn't handle it. Yeah, she had some sort of she had some sort of issue for some reason, and, and and maybe maybe they had some sort of rule, or maybe she had you know she had her own perspective. Maybe she dealt with a bunch of guys who had like mirrors on their shoes or or, or something. I don't know, but but you know maybe her experiences mm. dictated that she should just be sus- suspicious of of men in general, who knows, you know, I didn't really begrudge her of it. It was, it was extremely annoying at the time because it, it annoyed my daughter even more than me, but you know, I don't know. <laughs> Thinking back on it, it's kind of hilarious. Uh, uh, uh. Interesting. All right. Well, uh, she was looking out for your daughter, so that was good, but interesting. She, she could have at least asked, you know, who you were, why you were there, you know. Oh, she knew. She knew why I was there. I mean, it was a little tiny area. So she knew. She even heard my daughter call to me and say, Dad, just come back here. So she heard all that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, whatever. It's a shame there's so many situations that that go on that, that you, you know, she would need to be that concerned. But right. anyway, that's another show, too. All right. Now, <clears throat> having having read part of the book, um, and <laughs> knowing that you're you know, talking about dating sites, I, I believe that I read that you actually created a dating site. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. So uh, one of my skill sets is full stack web developer, and I didn't even know what that was, but it meant somebody who has the ability to do everything <laughs> from building uh, the databases to the front end of it and all this, all the gears. And so I can build things like Facebooks and Amazons and Ebays and stuff like that. So I couldn't help it uh, after going on all the dating sites and finding them all to be essentially backwards. uh, I went and built my own (laughs) and I built it too well because that's when I found that I could never really do anything with it because, and, and I had about 500 members when I shut it down and I built a dating site because I figured out they were all backwards in which everyone connects in such a way that they're sort of exposed. Like you learn too much. Like you don't need to know someone's religion. If you're just seeing their picture, you don't need to know, you know, all these things about them. Um, So I thought, okay. And I made this big list of dating sites and real life. And I thought, okay, 
you know, uh, slot number one, um, da, da, da. Oh, real life one, da, 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 uh, the next one, real life one, the next one, real life, real life one every single time except for one. And the one that real life lost on was the ability to put all these supposedly single people right in your face because that's what a database should be able to do, obviously. If you say, hey, within 50 miles of me, show me a list of all the lovely ladies who I might be attracted to who are fit within, you know, are age appropriate and stuff like that. You can't do that walking into a Starbucks. You can do that with a database. So everything else, real life wins. So I thought, well, I'm going to build a website that capitalizes on this and tries to win in the other areas. So I built it so that it would mimic the way you meet in real life. You'd see a picture of another person. You'd see the picture. No words, no nothing, just one name. Are you attracted? Do you have a spark? Yes or no? Yes? Okay. Then it waits to see if the other person says yes. And if the other person says yes, that's two people with the spark. So it's the same as you looking at someone in a, in a Starbucks, and they look back at you, and they keep looking. Hello. So that means they're also interested as well. So then it would show about seven stats of the person. And the stats would be things that you would get by standing in line at a Starbucks or wherever. And you'd get to know how tall they are because you're standing next to them. You'd get to know their name. Uh, they might share with you how many kids they have and so forth. And then you both would decide whether you want to chat because in line, if you say, Oh, Hey, how are you? Oh yeah. I have 75 children. Oh, okay. Have a nice day. And so, you know, you, <laughs> or whatever. Right. And so, um, um, you would either part ways with them in the Starbucks or whatever, or, or not. And then you'd get somebody's number, you know? And so it, it worked that way as well. And after you chatted for a while on the site, it would literally say, excuse me, you guys have chatted X amount of times. You guys should probably meet. And so the site was actually kind of, not crabby, but it was sort of going, dude, the whole reason for the site is for you to meet. This is an end. This is a means to an end. It's not a playground. It's not, it's not a social media site. It's, it's, a, it's a tool for you to use to meet other people. But all the other dating sites don't do that. And I'll tell you the dirty, terrible secret in a second. And so they don't want you to meet people. That's correct. Because if they, cause they meet, if you meet, it's the only product that people sell that if it works, they lose money. <laughs> So if you go and you buy laundry detergent and it works, you go, yay, I'm never buying this again. No, you buy more of it. But if you go to a dating site and go, yay, it worked. I'm never using this dating site again. So they need to keep you engaged and enthralled and thinking that people are interacting with you. And they all have the same system in which when you fear a new person, they boost you and they put you in front of a ton of people and you get all this interaction and go, wow, this is really cool. I should go buy this. I should go to silver tier on this door and then I'll do a reverse mortgage right after that. Uh, so, um, <laughs> So they would um, they would go and um, and they do that sort of thing. So there was all these tricks and things that dating sites were doing. And mine was just get on, connect with people, talk to them, and then meet. And but one of the other things I was doing too was I was only allowing for you to have three outgoing connections to people. In other words, I like Linda, I like Nikki, and I like Teresa. Okay. Oh wait, but there's Sheila. Nope, can't like Sheila. You really realistically think you want to start a relationship with, with four women? How about just picking one of the three? So you'd have to either pull back from one of those or, um, or someone else would have to come incoming to you to like, you You could have 30 women like you, that's fine. But I thought realistically, if you're looking for a real monogamous relationship with someone, you don't need to connect with 75 people. You just go and connect with the ones that are important and try to play those out. So the site would also limit you in that way as well. Okay. Well, and then if you decide you're not interested in one of them, you drop that off and then, mm -hmm. then you go to see another one, right? Exactly, okay. exactly. Well, I mean, you know, that would get rid of like all the cam girls in there trying to do stuff and all the guys that are just looking to get laid by everybody and all that kind of exactly. stuff. So. Exactly, right. And I was naive enough to think that everyone who's on a dating site is actually looking for like a monogamous relationship, silly me, but there are people looking for hookups and things and good for you. Just, but, but don't use my site, use some other site. Right. Well, they do have a site for everything out there. I mean, yeah. So, but, well, and you were up to 500. Were, were there 500 real people doing it the way you meant for it to be used? Um, uh, uh, darn near. Yeah. Pr pretty close. Cause it was hard to have a fake account because you couldn't just log in and spam 200 accounts. 
Also, you couldn't write right. to people. You couldn't write. So I, so I pretty much nipped in the bud all the tools that the scamming people would use. They'd have to keep coming back and have some patience and all that stuff. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah. So you wanted them to do it like real dating. Exactly. Kind of it thing. was literally, yeah, it was literally using technology to mimic what happens in real life. And that's the whole point. I mean, technology should be used for good. I mean, that's, that's the way it should be worked. It shouldn't, you shouldn't create this monster out of technology. That's its whole new thing. Like, and that's what dating sites are right now. You know, the, the depression's way up and people are disconnected and empathy is way down because people connect on social media and dating sites. And there's this, there's this believed anonymity that isn't really there. And then people don't treat each other properly. If you put if you put people on a dating site in a room, they would definitely treat people <laughs> each other much differently than they would if they're just online. Right. Yeah, it's it's amazing what social media has done to human beha- behavior. Right. And but it, I it, mean it was it was developed to change behavior and it has in really rotten ways. Yeah. So, <clears throat> okay, so what, what are, just to educate the listeners, what are the five secrets to dating sites? And I, I do I, I do agree with your five secrets, oh, especially okay. the last one. Okay, I will have to, um, I'll have to remember. What, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, let, me, let me see if I can just work through them and, and hopefully I won't forget. Let's see. So one of the dating, one of the, one of the things was they don't want you to meet, which is what I mentioned, because if, if you meet, you stop using the product. So that's one of the secrets. Um, one of the secrets I think, and stop me if I'm wrong, is um, the, the, they'll give you like a free weekend in which you can connect with or whatever with anyone, but you're really not. They're just doing that thing where they boost people so that they interact more, but then they'll say, oh, you want to actually go further, then you have to pay. Um, but, well, the, the free communication thing. Yeah, the free communication, yeah. It's, there's nothing free about that because it doesn't do anything. It's just sort of a, a bait and switch. Um, well, and it's, it's not actual communication. You can send, like, the phrases they pick. They have a couple, like, free phrases that you can send. And then the other person can send you free chosen message, free phrases that they have at their disposal kind of thing. You can't actually send them your message and that kind of thing. So it, right. it's useless. Right, right. Um, so one of the things is also uh, that you're just a warm body because – and that's why my – Dating site was destined to fail because I would never reach what I call critical mass. And critical mass is that everyone's on the site, so everyone should go on that site. It's the same thing with Facebook. Uh, when Facebook was at the height of its popularity, if there was something that was like Facebook, it, even though it was just as good if, or even better, it would never take off. Just like all these, all these Twitter knockoffs that, that tried to appear, they just nothing happened with them because everyone's on Twitter. So everyone's where everyone is. Um, and, but you're, you're just a warm body basically. So they want you to have there to be more and more people. So they'll make it as easy as possible to like suck you into creating an account. Um, another thing, one of those secrets, which most people know, and you just touched on was that, you know, the fake profiles are, are everywhere. Like so many of the profiles are fake. And when I say oh, fake, yeah. they're either, they're either bots that the company won't admit to creating <clears throat> or they are, um, you know, people who are trying to scam people out of money. You know, I see that all the time. I see the, I see, I see the pictures of women with a name like Michael or Bill or like some literal like George or something like that, where it's like the people from whatever country created this don't understand our naming scheme for men and women. So they just like randomly pick names. And it's so right. obvious when I'm, when I'm connected to a script because they'll say, oh, da, 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 and I'll write something back and nothing happens. And then I'll say, oh, I didn't use a keyword. So I'll literally write response number seven, and then they'll write back to me, and I'll go, okay, here we go. So, um, the, and again, the fake profiles is because so it looks like there's a lot more people. And the, um, they, uh, what, and I, don't, I don't know if I ever listed this as one of the, the reasons, but um, they want it to look like there's activity. And they do all sorts of cheating things to make it look like that. For example, you'll get this thing pop up on your phone or whatever that'll say, you know, this person liked you. So, of course, you go online and now it shows that you're active, 
Oh, another active person. What an active site. I'll find someone in no time here. Um, or mm-hmm. you'll, con- you'll connect up with your phone. You put it away in your purse, and five hours later, it still says you're online. Oopsie, we forgot to turn that off. And because you're online, Bill writes to you and, and, you know, because he thinks you're going to get a qu- he's going to get a quick response because you're online versus somebody who's not online. And of course, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because then you get a little buzz that says, oh, Bill wrote to you. So then you go online and you write back to him. Uh, and they do that sort of thing all the time. And so much frustration is caused by that. They're, you know, men and women are both writing each other saying, I know that you are online. You've been online for like a day and you haven't written back to me. It's like, oh, okay. You know, it's like, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, one of the biggest ones that I could probably get flack from is that matching just doesn't work. I mean, that's, like I said, that's not really the way it works. Like you answer all these questions, you know, and one of them, the one that the gentleman looks like Orville Redenbacher, which one is that? It's, um, oh, oh, your harmony. <laughs> um, sorry, no offense to Orville Redenbacher or the person who created that, but he just sort of reminds me of that. He, um, he, that site basically uses like an, a, a huge 100, like 100 question test, which part of the, I can tell, obviously, a lot of those questions are from the five love languages, and some of them are from some of the other personality tests, and they put them all together, and then they have you answer all of these questions, and after answering all these questions, they then change your radius to 100 miles, and they find you like two people. <laughs> and it's like, well, yes, mm-hmm. 100 miles, I could easily find two people, thank you. But I mean, in real life, those questions don't matter. What matters is what's on your gauges and if the person registers on your gauges. And the interesting thing is your partner's gauges may be completely different. And I make that distinction in the book, not to kind of go to 90 degree angle here. But when it comes to your love interest, they turn you on because of how they register on your gauges. When it comes to your friends, you're friends with them because their gauges match. You don't, you don't, you know, you're not somebody... You're not someone who's an upstanding citizen that says, boy, I really like Bill because he's a great arsonist. <laughs> I mean, do you, 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 you typically match on morals and things. You guys are in the club together. There's something that you guys connect with. And I'm not talking about necessarily the gaggle of women. There's 11 women. They get together and, oh, Shirley is so crazy. That's Shirley. <laughs> We're not talking about that. We're talking about mostly people who have besties and things like that where you guys see eye to eye on a lot of stuff. That's what makes a friend versus uh, be, having it spark with another person. Yeah, that's that's different. But yeah, there yeah. was um, <laughs> there was this one person that knew a friend of mine, and we were all on the same site, right? And and this person could not have been more different from me on like okay. every level about everything. Okay, right? Did not agree on anything, and I <laughs> happened. To hear, and I knew that they were on the site. I said, I, I wonder, I wonder. So I changed my location so that we'd be on the same section of it, you know. Okay. And, and look, they, and the site, which is, you know, supposed to be one of the more reputable, had us match 98%. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. But seriously, I mean, in, in real life, didn't agree on anything. Absolutely mm-hmm. nothing. Right. It's like, okay, talk, talk about it. Flawed matching system, right? But, yeah. Exactly. No. And and the thing and the thing is that the thing that bothers me the most is that these <laughs> dating sites will do this this matching and algorithms and stuff. And when the human beings actually connect up and do all the work and all the leg work and all the all the stuff themselves to actually connect up, then the dating site will take uh, they'll take credit for that. You see that all the time, oh, you know. It's like, no, that's not, you guys didn't do anything. All you did is you're just a matching database. You put two people in contact who might not have been in contact. That's it. You did nothing else. And you should, they did all the work, period. <laughs> so there. <laughs> it's a, a wow. Just wow. I don't know. It's, uh, yeah. So e- even, if, even if it says you match... 30% worth a look. <laughs> right. And that's where the spark comes in because if you're physically, you have a physical spark with them, that that's what gets you to turn your head enough to go, okay, now let's have a conversation. And the conversation can be that way. And the, the dating sites just, they keep finding ways to split people up. Oh, put this badge on because you're pro-choice or you're not pro-choice. Put this badge on because you voted. Put this badge on because of this, that, or the other thing. It's like, whoa. You know, can we keep dividing people even further or can we just let nature take its course? 
Yeah, I am. I am not a fan of of labels on people, anyway. So, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I, I don't know, but that, craziness, craziness, craziness. But um, <laughs> hmm. so so what what are what's the what's the answer? What are relationships based on? So they're they're based on status and they're based on they're based on what's on your gauges. That's what you're you know, and each person's uh, unique and each person should not beat themselves up for being attracted to a certain kind of person. I mean, period. That's just that's just the pure honesty there. I have a book called Three Voices in which I talk about the three ways our brains communicate. And uh, and our, our first our first voice is what um, people would call intuition, knee jerk reactions, gut feelings, things like that. And that's honest. That first voice is just pure honesty. It's just saying, I like that, yeah. you know, and if you feel like you're connect, you're uh, attracted to something unhealthy, well, then yeah, maybe you should look into that a little bit. But if you like a certain kind <laughs> of person and it turns you on, or you just, I don't know, I just really like this kind of person or this kind of person, then that's fine. You know, we, we spend too much time beating ourselves up and going, well, you know, common wisdom says I should like this or, or that or the other thing. Well, sometimes we're attracted to something for reasons we don't understand. And that could be because it's our normal. And it may be unhealthy. You know, it may be just because that's what we're used, used to because maybe we were raised around that or we're just used to that. And sometimes it is something we need to deal with. Oh, know, absolutely. And that's right. And that's why I mentioned the unhealthy. In fact, you know, I, I, um, I actually was, uh, I can, did a fundraiser for people in abusive relationships a while back. And, you know, I learned a lot. And one of the things was people who are in abusive relationships tend to return to them because it feels normal. It feels like home to them. Right. And that's, that's horrible, but that's true. You know, everyone, you know, normal is however things, you know, how, however you were brought up, you know, if you came from a house with physical violence, that's going to seem normal to you as well. So unfortunately, you know, a lot of times people will seek out their parent, even if their parent was not such a great person when it comes to the embodiment of the person that they're going to be with. Right. Well, and, and some people just seem to gravitate to narcissists because that's what they're used to, you know, or, or somebody's going to talk down to them or treat them badly or that kind of thing. So Whoa, that's, that is, yeah, that I touch on that in the book. Mm-hmm. So so that's actually, um, you know, under the douchebaggery section. Um, so, you know, and that's somebody who's intentionally reducing the status of another person. If uh, and and when you re- if you have the ability to get into a relationship and reduce the status of another person, they will become more attracted to you. And that's unfortunate, but that's the way that we work. That's the way we're built. We're built to seek out people that we consider are higher status individuals and try to impress them. Because if we can make them happy, then they will validate us. And by validating us, they are providing an emotion that is more powerful than any emotion that any human can experience, including love. Underline, underline case closed i'm sorry it, it's it's just that's the truth and that's the control situation and mechanism in that situation that's how that works um you know you know it, it's long known that you know guys who are jerks and so forth will get into a relationship with a, with a beautiful woman and tell them they're not so beautiful and tell and, and you know and tell them things to make their self-esteem go away and then they give them the little bits and crumbs of self-esteem that keeps them going uh, another example of that which i give in the book which is not so horrible is imagine a woman who's in, in the grocery store and a guy who's absolutely Brad, Brad Pitt ask a you know, gorgeous guy da, da, da. he grabs the flowers and walks over here with his big blue eyes and says, here, I just needed to give these to you because I just think you're so stunning. And she would tell that story and say how it was the most amazing thing in the world and how it was out of a fairy tale book. And that's, you know, it's like her book boyfriend. Now imagine the same thing as with a guy, and no offense, but a guy who's kind of heavy set and has like a, you know, has like a Dungeons and Dragons t-shirt on or something like that. And he comes over and he does the same thing and walks over and says, I think you should have it. And she tells the story and says, can you believe how creepy that guy is? Ew. You know, like pay for them. Like you can't even afford these flowers and you're going to walk them over to me because it's all about status. The other guy's status was way up there and it spoke to her to have somebody who's this bright shining being do that to them while his the other guy's status was lower than hers. Mm-mm. Am I speaking crazy yeah. or is this making sense? 
Well, it makes sense to a point, but you know, I, both should be flattering. Should be, should be, should be. But um, well, it, I honestly, it it would depend on. Because I've I've had that happen with both sorts of people, and it depends on the body language and the behavior of each person. But that gets back to status, though, because if the body language and the behavior of the second guy was one that made it look like he was confident, now that raises his status. So if you start to introduce elements in which you change his status, well, then it will change her reaction to it. Uh, by the same token, if you have a friend who says, I want to set you up on a blind date, and they set you up on a blind date with somebody, and that person is decent, so they have the same status or higher, they'll be like, oh, cool, you know, this is, this is kind of cool, da, da 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 If the status of the person that you introduce them to is way high, now the person becomes really nervous, like they don't think they're good enough. If you introduce them to somebody whose status is way low, and when I say status, I mean, you know, all that stuff that people would say, she's a three, right. she's a 10, all that stuff. So if your friend considers themselves to be a five and you introduce them to somebody who's a two, they're going to be really pissed off at you. <laughs> Why did you think that? Why did you think I was, well, I'd be attracted to that person? Don't you think more of me? Because, because of the way that it works. Because in the same way that the woman in the, in the hypothetical store was like, ew, get away from me. You know, it's, just, it's just the way that we react to things. We, we are constantly assessing the status of, of everything in that manner. And it sounds shallow, but it's not. It's just a, a programmatic thing our brains do. So it, it's our perception, and our perception is based on all of these things. Right, but um, you're hitting it right on the head there because you are in yeah. control of what you think the person's status is. That's the that's the amazing mm -hmm. thing. And... and, okay. and and so, and that's so, so a couple of things. That's where the gauge comes in. So if, if there's somebody that no one else says, I don't know what you see in him, but on your gauge of loyalty and dependability and kindness, this person rates really high, but all your friends don't see any of that because he's not going to go and do all this stuff for them. They may not understand why these two people are together, but you are the person giving the status. Just like an example I use on one of the books is when we, when we have in the olden days, it would be Valentine's Day and everyone brought a Valentine for everyone else, right? So that your kid went home with 29 Valentines and then immediately dumped them in the trash. Um, but, you know, I, I give the example of Susie who gets the Valentine from, from Rick. And it's the same Valentine that he gave to everyone else. It doesn't even have her name on it or whatever. You know, I choo choo choose you, whatever it says in the card. And she clutches it to her chest like it's the ring of Sauron, like it's this magic item. <laughs> oh, my God, because it came from Ricky. And the reason it has this magic power is because she holds him so high. There's something about him that she gives him a super high status. So that comes all from her. So, yeah, it's a very very tricky thing because we create the status of the other people by how we judge them. Okay. So each of us have our own dashboard and gauges <laughs> which determine the status of other people. Correct. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm, it, it, it's, it's the, the, the fog is clearing and I'm getting this. Okay. <laughs> Just, just making sure that I'm, I'm okay. And each, each person's, each person's dashboard and, and gauges are okay. So, and and our dashboard and our gauges are determining our personal status, also, correct? Right. That's our personal dashboard. Yeah. So, like I said in the book, I have there. There's actually three dashboards. There's one for the people that we would fall in love with, one for ourselves, and one for our friends. So, we also have a dashboard we look down in. And we go, oh, that's who I think I am. That's the best me. Or that's what I like about me. Okay. Okay. How, how can we, because most times we don't see ourselves in the same light other people do. Absolutely. Correct. Okay. So how can we, or can we, uh, improve how we see ourselves on our dashboard. 
That's a great question. And typically, uh, the, the first step of that is to see our dashboard, to see that we do have these requirements for ourselves, because then you can go, wow, that's kind of absurd. Why do I need to be a nine in dependability, but I don't care about anyone else? Why, why do I have to be so dang dependable? That's weird. Um, because you will find that you probably have absurd expectations in one or more areas of your life about yourself. Um, you okay. know, raising my, raising my two kids by, by myself, I had absurd expectations about, you know, being sick or, or not being there for them or whatever. I just absolutely, that was, it was absurd. Um, but and once you're kind of enlightened by the way you look at yourself, one, one of the biggest things, one of the, one of the biggest tricks I think you can do, and I talk about this in one of my podcasts, is that you look at yourself like you're someone you really care about, someone else, like your daughter, your, your, your friend, uh, your bestie, whatever. And we will have this internal and external monologue where we'll say, yeah, I did that because, you know, I'm kind of stupid, right? Well, imagine saying that about your, about your friend's nine-year-old. Yeah, she said that she did that because she's kind of stupid. Oh, my God, right? Like it has this completely different impact. Well, we should be treating ourselves with just as much care and love. And that's where all the whole self-care and self-love comes from. But we hear those buzzwords and we go, la, 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 what's for dinner? So... Um, right. we, de- right. we need to be treating ourselves with that much external and internal respect. So the way to do that is to basically look at yourself as a separate entity and go, okay, what does Mark deserve today? You know, does Mark deserve to be beaten up because he didn't do this to 100% or was 99.5 good enough today? Let's cut him some slack. Stuff like that. Right. Okay. All right. Interesting. Okay. I'm I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Okay. Um Huh. Okay, while while I'm letting all that settle and, and make sure I don't have any last minute questions, tell us about your card game. You developed a card game too, right? Uh, yeah, I did. I did. I did it as a joke. I did it um well, I don't want to say as a joke cuz it's an awfully serious joke in which I spent an in, in inordinate amount of effort on. So the card game was basically called the status game as well. And the card game, essentially, the um, tagline for it is date down, marry up. And so what it's all about is can it, it's, it's, a, it's about it allows, you know, four or more players basically to um, to play this card game in which um, you're dealt a, a bunch of cards and you become that person. And for some reason, people who weren't millennials got that instantly. But millennials, when they played it, were like, wait, I don't have little kids. I don't have this. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not you. If this is you in the game. And for some reason, that it kept coming up. But anyway, it has, it has cards that oh, – one, one second. Let me grab that. What if millennials could, like, get the game of life? Huh. Interesting. Uh, so one of the um, – so, you know, it, have, it would have positive and negative cards. It would have, it would have ca- cards that essentially would lower your status, like young kids would reduce it, bad job, long-distance relationship, um, unbearable addiction, um, things like that, uh, high maintenance and so forth. And then it would have cards that would raise your status. And those cards like good job and uh, you play sports or you're really attractive or you're wealthy or you – or so forth, even little cards like retail therapy, which would actually, you know, improve your mood and things like that. So um, you you draw your hand, but people wouldn't see that. They would see if you were really tall or if you were really attractive because that's visible. So that would be laying on the table. And then you'd sort of ask people to date and they would say yes or no. And then when you would date, you'd have to give up part of your hand because it's like giving up part of your time to the person. And there's some cards that sort of freeze up your hand where – Somebody asks you to date, and you're like, I'd like to date you, but I can't. I'm too busy <laughs> because you literally can't put away any of your cards. They're locked in your hand. So I accommodated that. And then if you get the um, will you marry me card, then you can ask somebody. Uh, but something I really had some fun with because I'm just sadistic like that is I had, um, I had a harmless communication card, and I also had uh, a flirting card. And so it was the only card that you could pass to someone else during the game when it wasn't your turn. <laughs> and see, since you're trying to free your hand up a bit, you would, you would happily give away the harmless chatting. You don't want that in your hand. That does nothing. Um, but it looks an awful lot like cheating. <laughs> so when you have the cheating, when you have like the, the cheating card, you would give that to, to someone. Oh, no, the flirt card. You would give the flirt card to someone because 
if you gave the flirt card to someone, they have to take it first of all. When it comes around to be your turn and you ask them to date, they have to date because you sort of, you know, grease the wheels of progress there. So, but I literally had these people that didn't know each other, these, these men who, um, at this meetup group, and this guy looked really upset. He was this big guy too. And he looked really upset at the other guy and, and everybody kind of froze and said, what's wrong? And, it, and, and I said, you look like you were upset. And he said, I was, because he was jealous of the guy that he was dating, <laughs> flirting with someone else. It was hilarious. It was such a fun thing. No, that's fun. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so that was the card game I did. It was kind of a d- demonstrative way to sort of show how status works. It really, it doesn't have any of the nuance of what we've talked about in the books and the, in the dashboards and any of that stuff. But I thought, well, this is another use for this. This could be fun. And so I do have a seminar I'm planning in which I'm going to be utilizing the deck with the audience so that we can kind of have some fun interaction. Right. Well, it is, it is a visible way to get them to kind of grasp the different elements of what you're talking about. though. Absolutely. That's, that's right. It. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> um, uh, it gets a little too real for some people, evidently. So, I, I, but I think he got the point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I thought that was I thought that was really hilarious that the guy felt jealous towards another man, and that wasn't really he normally dated women. So that was really weird that he was like jealous of this guy who was cheating on him or was flirting with someone. So I thought that was like, okay, this works. Well, this he, definitely works. He playing cards and he was getting jealous. So that's, uh, yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. But like said, he was, he, well, he was getting the point though. So this is good. Oh, it worked. Absolutely. He got it. Absolutely. That is funny. All right. Well, how can people find out, find out more about you and, um, which of the books are available? Because there are three of them. Okay. So let me answer that in the, in the order it was received. So people can find out more about me simply by going to markbradford.org. So mark, markbradford.org. That's basically my hub for almost everything except my coaching and the podcast. So that's, that's my hub for all of my books and all that good stuff. Um, it lists all my that fiction. Is, what's that? That was dot .org, not dot .org, right? That's what it sounded like you said. Oh, my God. Uh, no, that's, that's for next year. No. <laughs> Yeah, that's if the, that's if this all works really well. No, um, dot org. Oh my God. Um, yes. So, uh, just clarifying. Yes. Thank you for. I appreciate your clarification. That's what makes you an important part of this whole conversation. Thank you. Uh, so, <laughs> the, um, uh, yeah. So markbredford dot org and. Um, uh, if you go there now, in fact, I have a new fiction coming up. It's actually my ninth book. It's done. It's uh, called The Devils in the Details. And people who actually go there and want to enter the contest, they can actually receive a free copy of it. Um, and then uh, by by reviewing it on Amazon, they are entered into a contest to actually win a, a free paperback copy. So you get to read it before other people do, and then you get entered into receiving a, a paperback copy. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I love feedback from people. The feedback I've gotten on it already is really amazing. So the other thing was you said yeah. the books. So I wrote the status game one. It was literally the first book I, I ever wrote and published and it, sh- it showed it was pretty rough. So I ended up pulling that off the shelves so that, and, and I wrote the status game two. And then now with the status game three coming out, I may actually pull two as well because you actually get the benefit of one two and the workbook in status game three so you sort of get this compendium that way although i think status game two definitely stands on its own so um again going to my site or going to amazon and looking for a status game by mark bradford or just mark bradford you'll find me uh one one of the the easiest way to find me as well on amazon if, if you look for the sword and the sunflower which is my epic trilogy that i wrote um, because that's a longer title that that's harder to find, like the wrong one. So, right. Well, it's still a game. It's nice to have all three in one book. So. Yes. Yeah. I think that's. I think it's a very cool thing. Yeah. Absolutely. It made sense to do that. It did. All right. Well, I think I think I actually have wrapped my mind around the idea. <laughs> so, but, um, Interesting, interesting. And like I said, I've I've started reading. I just haven't finished it yet. So Gotcha. Gotcha. But, well, thank you for being here today. You're and welcome. I hope thank you for audience, having me. 
got lots of good information. I hope that my questions didn't confuse them. And um, the information and the replay will be on the show page, which will be love www.lovecoachjourney.com slash status game. Cool. All right. And listeners, I'll be with you next time on Ready for Love Radio.